Good evening. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, attending the talk. It's great to be here. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about superhuman vision. And when I was preparing this talk, I decided to learn a little bit more about the Lemelson Foundation. So I had a look through the Lemelson website. So the homepage looks something like this, and you click a few tabs and you can learn more about the foundation, an overview, a little bit about the history of the foundation, and you can even download video games off their website. And if you actually play them, they're pretty good. It's called uh, Invention Adventures. But as I was scrolling through the different people on the website, I came across Stephanie's webpage. And her profile, she lists that her favorite invention is the camera, because photos capture stories and memories. And so this raises the question, what comes to mind when we say camera? Is it a rectangular box with a lens on it, and when I click the shutter, I end up with a flat two-dimensional image that I can print on a piece of paper? Or is it something else? If we look back at the history, in 1816, the first photograph was captured on silver chloride film. And about two centuries later, when I was just finishing up junior high, photography became predominantly electronic. You, ne you no longer needed to go develop your photos. And these are the two landmarks. Between them, we've had amazing things like you know, reflex cameras, auto exposure, metering, and the ongoing megapixel war. But really, the question I have for you today is, what do you think the third landmark in cameras will be? And to answer that question, I think we might need to redefine what it means to take a photograph. So here's a camera today. It's a box. It's got a lens in front of a sensor. And side by side, I've got a model of the human eye. It's pretty much the same thing, right? It's just a little bit more circular. And so I wonder, why should the camera mimic the human eye when maybe it's possible to go beyond, beyond human, superhuman, and my first example will deal with speed. So here's a speeding train with a woman standing static. And a slow camera, like our eye or like our cell phone camera, the train will be blurred out even though the woman is sharp. So about 50 years ago at MIT, a professor named Doc Edgerton tried to solve this problem using stroboscopic techniques. So his result is shown here with a bullet as it pierces through an apple. You can see that the bullet is just as sharp as the apple. And a famous ball player, his baseball at the bat at the moment of impact. So this is high-speed photography. Now, what would happen if we took Edgerton's technique but did it a million times faster than he did? What would such a camera look like? What would the photos from that camera look like? And so this has been an ongoing work at MIT in our research group. In 2011 and 2013, we had two results. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the latter. It's a low-cost technique to do exactly that. It's a $500 kit that you can buy or build using off-the-shelf parts. We call it nanophotography because of the speed it operates at. And so I'll just skip to how it works. Uh, you know, so you have the nano camera, and you take a look at a blank wall. Right? Now, imagine there's a light coming from the right side of that wall. If I have a slow camera like my eye, and I turn on the light in the room, the wall will light up instantly, seemingly instantly. But in reality, with the nano camera, you can actually start to see a pulse of light as it propagates along the wall. So you can see the wave front as it starts to cross across the wall. So this is happening at the speed that the light is traveling. And you can see the pulse as it passes the wall. And so it's not just about walls, but how would this look on an ordinary you know, scene with maybe some stuffed animals and a vase? And you can see that, excuse me, And you can see the pulse as it propagates. It's going to have some complex reflections within the vase. It's going to wash over the other objects in the scene, and then the pulse will leave. But it appears that the video won't play. <laughs> so the philosophy here is if you have a, you know, a light that's blinking at a high speed and there's no object in the middle, you'll receive a clean signal. But you put something complicated, like fog, rain, or some sort of scattering medium, and you'll see that the temporal profile is no longer uniform. And so using these cues, we can start to impact different sort of application domains, like consumer photography, robotics, and 3D imaging. So here's an example. Maybe you can see what's around the corner 
with superhuman vision. So, for example, here we have a man in a room, and we're just photographing the door. So we're going to get the backscattered light from the door and try to reconstruct an image of the man. And so we try this experiment with a little bit simpler object. We did a ping pong ball. The ping pong doll ball is hidden around the corner. The camera is just looking at that wall. And so if you actually do this, and using a, some clever mathematical techniques, as you move the ping pong ball, you can actually see the reconstruction in real time okay, with a low cost nano camera. And it's not just about ultra fast imaging. So maybe the photo goes beyond a 2D photograph that you can print on a printer. Maybe this is a photo of a coffee cup in the corner of my office at MIT. And it's 2D, it's flat. You know, you print it, it's on a piece of paper, and that's it. So what would a 3D photo of this object look like? If we had a 3D photo, what could we do? Well, one could go to a bazaar, you know, say they travel to India, go to a bazaar, you see an object you like, you take a 3D photo of it, you can print it when you come back to the United States. But today, the problem is, even a simple object like this coffee cup, we might use something like the Microsoft 3D camera. It's the latest model, well-engineered device, but the you know, quality of a 3D geometry is an ongoing problem. It's pretty difficult to get that. So you can see that there's these fine grooves in the coffee cup that are not really captured cleanly. And so what we did is, uh, those of you who were at the uh, showcase, maybe you saw some polarized optics demonstrations, and so we use the polarization of light. You know, take a 3D photo with a $30 polarizing filter. And maybe you can get a reconstruction that approaches this quality. And you can see the photorealism in the depth map. And here, even if you zoom in at high detail level, you can see those grooves have been captured. So this is moving towards a reality, I think, where we'll have 3D cameras, you know, tiny 3D cameras embedded on phones and other devices. And so if I were to sort of summarize the talk, it's really how we can go beyond photos, beyond photography. You know, not just ultra fast seeing around corners or 3D polarization cameras. Those are things that you know, we've come up with at MIT. But really, you know, what you guys will work on next. So I'd like to thank my collaborators, especially uh, as uh, Kathleen said in his talk, it's great to have good mentors. And a lot of this was conducted with a professor at MIT named uh, Ramesh Raskar. And uh, one of the strengths of invention, I feel, is working with other people, especially good collaborators, people who push you to be better, as, as we saw from Catherine's talk. And uh, my collaborators are listed here. But if I were to distill it down, a, a phrase that's often used is, uh, when teams win, dreams win. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>